Hello, everybody. My name is uh, Zoran Stojkovic, and I'm the Senior Coordinator of Quality Sport at Sport for Life. And this is my colleague, Shelly. Hi, I'm Shelly Roddy. I'm the Quality Sport Assistant here at Sport for Life on co-op this semester. And today we're going to be having a conversation with uh, Maya Rothwell. Maya is if there's, if there's one way I can put it is Maya is a, is a LTD champion. I mean, um, she's, and she's had lifelong involvement in sport uh, in multiple roles uh, as an athlete, as a coach, as an organizer, referee, sport developer. So she's really seen sport from all the different perspectives and lenses. And her primary sport is fencing. And she has participated in other sports as well, including swimming, athletics, tennis, uh, rugby, boxing, and Olympic weightlifting. Maya has an education degree, a management development certificate, and a fencing coach diploma. Uh, she was the executive director of Alberta Fencing, a, a senior sport consultant with Alberta Sport, and is currently a fencing coach and involved uh, with strategic management of EU funds. Maya, thanks for taking the time to speak with us today. Thank you. I'm really happy to be here. So um, is there anything that we've missed in that introduction and in that in that bio uh, that you'd like to add? Oh, <laughs> uh, well, no, it's it's a really good introduction. Thank you. But yeah, my, my involvement in sport is really lifelong, so I can go on and on, but <laughs> no need for that now. Yeah. Perfect. Um, so tell us about your background in sport and fencing. I mean, how, yeah, tell us a little bit about that. Okay, so um, well, I've uh, I've been involved with sports all of my life, really, and uh, fencing was the first sport that I really got hooked on. It was my my favorite sport that I never left this whole uh, this whole time. So I was introduced in, with fencing at the age of around twelve because one of my best friends was a um, uh, junior champion in Croatia. And uh, I was really keen on doing saber fencing because there's, there's three weapons in Olympic fencing, saber, epee, and foil. But um, in Zagreb at the time, there was only uh, epee and foil available. This was like 1997. Um, so I waited for a while and um, I was hoping that I was gonna have a chance to have saber in Zagreb, but no. <laughs> so at the age of around, like my early 20s, I started doing Epe and started being pretty competitive at Epe uh, pretty shortly. Um, but then I moved to Canada and started my life there, find, found a different club shortly after, uh, became the executive director of Alberta Fencing, as you noticed, as you said. And um, I stayed in that role for about three and a half years, which is where I literally had my fingers dipped in every aspect of sport from organizing tournaments, um, hosting referee clinics, coaching development clinics, uh, athlete support, high performance uh, equipment, and so on. Um, and around 2011, I had a chance to finally join Sabre at Sergey Sabre Club in Edmonton. And um, I immediately fell in love with it. And I did Sabre. Uh, for as long as I was in Canada and competed in Sabre. And um, yeah, so when I, when I came back to Zagreb in 2017, I decided that I really need to start Sabre in Zagreb finally, because it's been, I've been wanting to do it since 1997. So if nobody else is going to do it, I would. So <laughs> that's kind of my story with fencing. Yeah. Wow, that's interesting. So your friend was, uh, you, were, you said, I think you said a national champion who, who sort of got you into it. And then it was the sport that you never left. Yes, exactly. Nice. And when it comes to LTD, I mean, you lived in Canada for many years and you were involved in sport, as you mentioned, uh, both as an athlete and, and, and multiple roles as a coach, as a sport leader. How did you learn about LTD? Like what was your first uh, contact with it? And what was your experience in getting LTD concepts implemented in Canada? Wow. Um, so my first contact with LTD was uh, in my role as executive director of Alberta Fencing Association. Um, at the time, um, 
Manuel Belmonte from Fencing Canada was developing uh, the program for Canadian Fencing Federation. And um, I was, I was honestly, I was really, really enthusiastic about it from day one because um, I'm a teacher by profession. So it really made sense for me to, to break down all the important aspects of sport and present it to both parents and, and athletes. So they have a better understanding of how to develop through sport because fencing is such a complex sport. And a lot of times, even the spectators that watch it for years don't really kind of know what's going on. So this was a way to really break down um, all the elements and you know um, it gave us a lot of vocabulary that we can use with parents and explain like this is why your kid is at this stage as opposed to this stage and so on and um, I was really one of the first ones I think to get on board with that and I was super enthusiastic I made all these posters for fencing so kids can uh, take take track of their their progress as well as parents and um, I was part of the Canadian Fencing Federation the, uh, domestic development committee we called it for implementation of LTD in fencing in Canada and all the clubs and all the provinces because I was so enthusiastic about it I really really liked the concept from from day one yeah. and what is it that you loved about it like what is it that you really clicked with with uh, LTD? Well, first off, it was um, the, the interesting thing with the, the Canadian side of um, offensive side of LTD in Canada was was really that we kind of broke it down into armaments, as we called it. So just like judo or karate have belts with different colors that are um, uh, showing the progress that an athlete did. That's how we kind of broke down um, the progression levels in fencing. So that was my first click. Like this is a really good visual representation of development of a fencer. But also there was this whole matrix that was so good. Like, you know, there was all of a sudden there was mention of mental preparation in sport as well as physical preparation, as well as, um, you know, the, the uh, sport for life aspect. So active for life so that there's um, inclusion of all age groups. Right. So it wasn't just about kids or high performance or medals anymore. It was also about development of all ages, as well as, as you know, many, many athletes don't get to the Olympic level. But this presented an opportunity for everyone to stay involved in the sport in a, some, some role. Right. So, you know, maybe you were never a, a great competitor for whatever reason but you have this chance to become a good coach or an excellent referee or a knowledgeable volunteer. So there was something in there for everyone to be involved in the sport. Wow, that's quite something, isn't it? I, I love the arm, you said armbands, right? Yes. And yes. That, that was something athletes would physically wear, kind of like belts in karate? Yes, uh, well, it, um, uh, the Canadian Fencing Federation actually developed these kind of like badges, uh, patches for our white uniforms. Mm -hmm. So, so that, uh, you know, the, the, the first armband is white and then yellow and then orange and then so on. So um, you could recognize the level of a fencer from a badge, but also um, at a later time, they planned to implement um, some sort of a like, for instance, like if if you're not a blue armband, you can't actually go into nationals, which makes sense. Right. Because a lot of times the, the kids are not ready for that stage of competition. So it was like age and stage appropriate, which is mm -hmm. which is the point of it. Right. Um, I don't know how how much Canadian Fencer, Fencing Federation progressed since I left Canada, but um, I do know that a lot of clubs in Canada follow it and they have excellent retention for it, which is, which is also like really important. Yeah, it is. Those, those badges kind of run, look like, uh, remind me of uh, military stripes on, on the uniforms, you know, uh, yeah. it's hardcore. Um, and so what I heard you saying in, um, with getting involved with LTD is 
you really, your big job in the beginning was educating parents and getting their buy-in? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, and because fencing is such a complex sport, I would, I would often hear parents that have been around tournaments or fencing for years, still confused whose touch it is, what actually happened, why did referee say this or that? Like, um, it, it is a complex sport. And so this was a way to break down all the elements and present something to a parent where they had a feeling they were able to track their, their child's progress, just like in school. You know, all of a sudden it wasn't this confusing sport where nobody knows what's going on. But um, for example, you know, they knew my kid is going for a yellow armband test. And here are the questions and here are the things that my kids needs to know. And so the parent could literally have a look at the sheet and see their kid doing the actions and know exactly at, at which point they're they're on and also it was after you know passing an armband it would always be the question so when's the next test how do we get to the next level so it kind of kept parents engaged and interested as well and um, it wasn't only up to the kid and the coach to figure out the kid's level of progression which was I, I thought it was amazing perfect thank you for sharing that that's a great way to engage the parents as well as the kids and kind of put some emphasis on the parents learning as well. And thanks for sharing that enthusiasm around the LTD in Canada. So you're now in Europe and we understand you have brought your fencing and LTD expertise to the club where you are now. Can you tell us a little bit about that and how did you implement LTD and what worked well? Yes, for sure. So it was funny because, you know, while I was in Canada, I was really working with LTD on this kind of let's say higher, but not really. It's more of a policy or administrator or organizer level. And so when I came back to Croatia and um, in 2017, I enrolled in this uh, fencing coach school. And once I finished it, I got a job at one of the local clubs. And so it really felt like, okay, this is now testing everything that I tried to implement as a policy or strategic maker in Canada, now I'm going to actually test it out on the ground level and see how all of that works. So it was, I, I call it my micro LTD experiment, just to kind of see how it actually plays out. Of course, I never told my athletes that they're <laughs> my experiment, but I just tried to implement all the best practices and everything that I believed was, was really awesome on paper and see how it actually plays out in real life. So at first I started an EPE recreational group because EPE is the easiest weapon to, to teach adults. If, if you start at an older age, it's kind of it's hard to um, learn the rules of priority which um, are in saber and foil. So I started with an adult group of fencers and um, at first I had around five or six fencers. And they were all adults, but different, different age categories. So from like their twenties to like fifties, let's say. And so that was season one. And um, I, I really tried to make everything light and fun and, and kind of implement everything that I learned. And then as, as the seasons progressed, I had more and more people. And at one point in time, I decided, okay, now it's time for me to start a Sabre group. So in what was it i think like 2018 i had yeah at the beginning of 2018-19 season and i had about 25 fencers around 10 of them saber fencers and around 15 of them epe fencers and then in 2019 i decided to have a saber summer camp and i brought over my coach and friend and colleague from alberta who is also the president of alberta fencing federation for i think like 10 years now or something and he's an excellent coach and i brought him for a summer camp and um right after that there were worlds um fencing world championships in budapest and so i did something again, unorthodox, like I put a lot of recreational fencers in a van and we went to Bud Budapest to actually watch the worlds. Like nobody ever goes and watches fencing. <laughs> <laughs> but 
<laughs> but we did that because I wanted them to see how high performance fencing looks like and for them to be inspired and, and learn all these, you know, things and how it actually works in, in the world of like real fencing and competition. And that was a complete success. And, and at the beginning of next season, so 1920, I had 35 fencers. So this, this number constantly uh, uh, got bigger because my retention rate was quite high. And I really believe that it was because of all of the LTAD principles that I implemented. So first off, my number one rule at the club is no negativity. <laughs> So they can do anything. I really don't care. But as long as there's no negativity, as long as there's, I call it almost like the CrossFit environment where everybody is supportive and positive and encouraging. And I also uh, don't tell them that they can't do something. You know, a lot of times in fencing, you will hear, oh, you shouldn't compete before at least having two years of experience in a club and so on. I never told them this. I said, you know, you've been fencing for two months. There's a competition coming up. Great, let's do it. They're like, okay, because they just didn't know, you know. So I, a lot of times I, I push them into fire and pretend like it's nothing. And then they handle it really like it's nothing, you know. So uh, a lot of the, what I think are LTD uh, principles are implemented in that. So, so just kind of have fun, make sure that everyone is safe and respectful but number one is goal is having fun, you know, not point, putting any kind of crazy pressure on them, you know, talking about what happened in a competition, all this mental preparedness in game. But um, yeah, like the, the number one thing is fun, fun, fun. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, I feel like the emphasis on fun and the LTD principles that you put into um, your time in Europe definitely proved uh, good. Did you find there were any challenges with implementing LTD in Europe and how did you overcome those? Yeah, no, not really, because I mean, I, you know, it's, it's kind of like, I, you know, I'm, I'm trying to think of a metaphor for this, but it's kind of like, you know, when you have first graders, the first times the kids come to school, you don't tell them that it's going to be a really hard first year, that you need to teach them how to write and, and read and all these. You do everything through games and then they learn through games. So this was kind of similar to that. I never told them, you know, <clears throat> fencing is hard, complicated, and, you know, you have to do this, this and this before you can do that, that and that. No, I just presented everything as light and fun and so I, I i can't really say that i experienced some challenges like i did when i tried to implement ltad in canada in a way you know there's always some pushback from from coaches or whatever they're always saying you know you're not going to teach me how to teach fencing i've been teaching fencing for 20 years or, or whatnot right so th this is the the completely opposite set of rules it's just like you know this is kind of how we do things and it's fun and let's try it and see what happens. So I can't really say other, anything other that I've been really, really happy with how it worked out. <laughs> um, that's, I, I love that. And I love the no negativity that you mentioned because I think that's so important and that would definitely be one of the things that keeps people there because uh, it's fun you uh it seems like you sort of got people into it slowly as opposed to saying here's everything you need to learn yeah you did it through games you did it through fun and uh, it was a, it seems like it was a successful micro ltd experiment um what yeah. uh maya what advice would you give to coaches who are trying to implement the knowledge of ltd at the ground level well i mean it's you know, you don't have to know everything. Um, you can just try and, and, you know, have fun and try to find new ways of teaching your students other than from what you were taught, like what you were used to. Because, you know, I had my set of crazy coaches, <laughs> you know, I had times as an athlete where I cried on the piece under my mask because I was under so much pressure that I couldn't bear it. Like, 
I couldn't remember what fencing is, where I'm standing, what's happening, you know? So just relax a little bit, you know, it's okay. Um, I always start from like, nobody's going to embarrass me. I don't have a problem with my athletes coming to the competition for the first time in their life and being like dead last. I don't care. As long as they're fed, happy, there's water, there's fun afterwards. I really don't care, you know? So just kind of relax and don't, don't care too much about what, you know, everybody else are going to think. And then success comes you know, by itself. I, I can't even explain it, but honestly, like last, was it last year? Yes, last year in 2020, we had nationals, which is, and this is crazy, right? Honestly, this is crazy. I only teach recreational people, recreational, so adults. And we had nationals and my athletes won 14 national medals in all three weapons. And I don't even coach four. I don't coach foil, but they said, oh, this looks like fun. Could you go and sign up for foil? I'm like, sure, I'm going to find the foil, I'm going to find your equipment, go and have fun, you know? Uh, three weapons and across cadet, junior, senior, and veteran categories, 14 medals. And everybody's like, wow. how did you do that? I didn't do anything. I just let them have fun. You know, they train twice a week. Most of them have been in fencing for two or three years. Usually it's expectation is like you're in fencing for five or 10 years and then you get to this level. You know, it doesn't have to be that way. So just relax <laughs> and, and uh, believe in people. Trust, trust that, you know, they can do a good job regardless of how many tactical and technical rules they know. You know, it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't have to be that complex and directed all the time and perfect you know just let them have fun and people will surprise you that's that's that, my point. <laughs> that's amazing so some of the advice to coaches looking to implement lt ad that i heard uh, from that was breaking down some of those dogmatic views and practices of of how coaching has been done for a while that you have to be serious that you have to you know, it has to be very structured and all that sort of stuff that kind of should go out the window. Um, you don't have to know everything. So apply bits and pieces of what you learn from it. And then the thing that you repeated a couple of times was have fun and be, uh, be okay with, uh, with not sticking to those rules again and, and having people try competition, even though they haven't been fencing for five or six years. Yeah, exactly. There, no. And, and it's, it's really important to be respectful. You know, it's, um, I have a funny story. Like one of my athletes went to a competition where I couldn't go and he sends me a video and asks me, uh, you know, can you have a look and what were my mistakes and blah, blah, blah. And he was expecting that I'm going to comment on his fencing. But the first thing I noticed was that he didn't shake his, his opponent's hand. And he was like, he was, he was maybe three or six months into fencing. So he didn't know all the rules, right? It was an honest mistake. But I said, number one, always shake your opponent's hand. This is the number one thing. Everything else we can talk about in training, we can, you know, fix the counter six and the parry four and the blah, blah, blah. But number one, shake your opponent's hand. And he was like, oh. <laughs> you know, so. Uh, that's kind of my point you know safety respect and fun and everything else as a coach you already know you know the strategy of your sport you know the technical and the tactical stuff and you're going to teach them that's all well and fine but you know there's there's time for that uh, as long as they're having fun they're being respectful and they're being safe everything else will come along yeah. perfect thank you for sharing that yeah i think fun is sometimes overlooked and a lot of people focus a lot on all the other aspects of it. So what would you say, I'm sure there's times where there's pressure and stuff that your athletes feel, what would you say is like the key to keeping that positive culture within your group and keeping that fun environment? Well, I, 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 to be honest, I think it's just a part of my personality as well. I'm, I'm like that in life as well. You know, we can do everything and everything is yeah, okay with me, as long as there's no negativity or somebody is being disrespectful, then I snap and I'm just like, you know, <laughs> you know, but um, 
I, I really think that's kind of the main thing, you know, as long as I sense any kind of negativity in my club, we stop everything and we discuss it. And no, this is one thing we cannot do. You know, there's no looking down on someone. There's no looking down on yourself for silly mistakes that you're going to correct anyways. You know, um, I, I never allow my, uh, my athletes to say, oh my God, I was so stupid. No, 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 no. None of that. None of that. It's just, let's, you know, regroup. Let's see what we can do better. Let's see how this is going to turn out well for all of us. You know, let's just focus on positive stuff all the time without exception, you know, and I can, I can see if somebody is, you know, sad or, or mad or something bad happened, we'll discuss it. We'll go through it. That's fine. You know, but just no moping around, no being disrespectful, no talking behind somebody's back. No, none of that. That's, a big no-no. <laughs> Everything else we can work through. So, yeah. <laughs> well, it seems like you really consciously take care of the dynamic within your club and your groups and uh, the no negativity, the, hey, okay, you said this, we're going to stop practice, we're going to stop training, let's address this, let's talk about this, here's why you don't do it. So it seems like you really like explain it to people as well as opposed to just like having rules of you don't do this without knowing why no of course and, and of course you got to know they're adults so with, with some things it's easier and some things are harder mm. with them you know it's easier because they're going to understand what you're trying to explain and at the same time they have their own characters and their own lives and they're they're developed people by now right so there's this kind of balance you know but it's it, I still see it as positive because you know I haven't had anybody walk out because of this but if somebody is so keen on being ne negative let them walk out you know I only want to have a positive environment and, and positive people and I also have like a really diverse group you know that's another thing I have I have a whole family, so a father and two daughters and a son-in-law. So the four of them are a family that comes to fencing. And then there's a father and a daughter that comes to fencing. And he also, this is really funny because he stopped fencing in 1994 <laughs> mm. and came back to my group is now fencing again. Now his daughter is fencing with us and she's a complete beginner and he is obviously a veteran and, and so this is an interesting dynamic and then I have one person with ADHD like completely random <laughs> you know and I have one person with diabetes so we also have to kind of monitor that and take care of that I even have one person he used to fence uh, right-handed but then he lost his right arm and now he fences left-handed he came back to fencing and now he has to kind of learn relearn fencing with with his non-dominant hand right so it's, it's a really diverse group so you know to keep all of this kind of like in check you really have to be positive and and make the emphasis on fun otherwise no way <laughs> wow that's quite quite a variety and it, it seems like um, each of those people has their own place in the ltd uh, pathway uh, exactly like you're yeah. talking about the dad who stopped fencing and then has continued now so he's he's now in the active to life phase and yeah. and you have somebody who's starting out so there may be an early involvement um amazing um maya do you have any any final thoughts any parting thoughts to, to share with us on this sure um I just want to say like while I was trying to implement LTD from this policy maker or, or sport developer perspective, it all looked really good on paper, but I couldn't feel it like I, I, I wasn't sure if it's going, going to turn out awesome in practice. And now I know that it actually really does. And it's worth a try. Like any aspect of LTD, any part of that education that comes for your sport with the LTD booklets or your guys' seminars or whatever, um, just find something that relates to you and try it out and just see what happens. The worst thing that can happen is it doesn't work out for whatever reason, but I really, really believe that it will. I believed it before, but now I actually know it's through practice that it really, it really does work. So just, just give it a shot. And you have 
sport for life support. So <laughs> you're never wow. alone. You know? That's that's huge. I think because sometimes you don't see um, there's going to be policymakers and people that work in the sports system and who are implementing these sorts of things who don't see things from the ground. So it might even be an invitation to go visit some of the clubs and to see how it's actually working, to see that it is having an impact and uh, yes. and, and to believe that it is going to work. Yes, exactly. Maya, thank you so much for taking the time to, to speak with us. Like, is there, if, if anybody wants to connect, is there a way that people can connect with you? Yeah, for sure. They can always find me on Facebook or send me an email, uh, maia.rathwef. LL at gmail.com is my email. You can maybe put it somewhere as well with, with the link for this video. And I'm always open for discussion with fellow coaches or administrators or whoever would like to chat with me. I'm, I'm open for it. So go ahead. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thanks again for taking the time to, to share with us and uh, to provide your, your experience uh, with us. Thank you.